This episode of the Music Tech Teacher podcast is brought to you by Smart Music. Still the trusted way to connect teachers and students, the new Smart Music is in the cloud, so it works with the devices your students have today. Best of all, you can use it for free. Learn more at smartmusic.com. You're listening to the Music Tech Teacher podcast, episode number 19. Welcome to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. Music tech tips, lesson ideas, advice, news, and interviews, especially for music teachers. Brought to you by midnightmusic.com.au. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. I'm your host, Katie Wardrobe from midnightmusic.com.au, the place for music teachers to get the help they need using technology in music education. I'm very happy to say that today I'm welcoming another guest to the show. Her name is Barbara Friedman and she has been teaching electronic music, composition, audio engineering and probably more at Greenwich High School since around 2001. She's a leading voice in the music technology and education field and she runs professional development courses and has presented at many conferences throughout the world. In 2013, her book, Teaching Music Through Composition, a Curriculum Using Technology, was published by Oxford University Press, and it's really become a go-to music tech handbook for teachers around the world. She's a top percussionist as well, and she appreciates good coffee, I know this, and she's a huge fan of Australian rules football, (laughs) which always makes me laugh. (laughs) Welcome, Barbara. Well, thank you. I'd like to just have a shout out, please, to the Sydney Swans, my team. So uh, sorry for you uh, Melbourne listeners. Uh, Oh, it it makes me laugh so much. Um, For those that don't know, Aussie rules football is huge in Australia and especially in Melbourne where I live because, you know, the game was, you know, it's kind of got its home here in Melbourne. And um, yeah, it it cracks me up because I'm not into football really at all. And Barbara, I met and then discovered that she's really into it. So uh, I ended up taking a couple of uh, Sydney Swans garments over, I think a scarf and a hat when I visited last year, which was hilarious. I had to make sure I went to the shop before I left and popped into New York and saw Barb and and managed to give her that. So that was lots of fun. (laughs) (laughs) It's a lot of fun. Uh, My granddaughter loves the hat, by the way. She looks really cute. Yes, I remember seeing the photo (laughs) of her. It's excellent. Uh, And our our football season's just started, so they're all getting into it now. It's great. It is great. So tell tell us a bit about the school that you're teaching in. So you've been there quite some time now. Uh, Greenwich High School is a a suburban school in what uh, they call a bedroom community here. In other words, uh, people live in the suburbs but mostly commute to New York. So Greenwich is a suburb of New York and a lot of people commute to New York City. Uh, The population of the town is about 70,000. Um, There are uh, 11 elementary schools, three middle schools, and this one high school, the population is somewhere between 2,600 and 2,700 students in the one high school. Um, So we have, it's it's pretty big. It's the third largest school in the state of Connecticut. That's huge. Um, Yeah. It's pretty big. It's pretty huge. Um, And, you know, we have smaller, you know, subsections and houses and things to try and make it smaller, seem smaller, but can't do that. Just can't. So that's just um, massive. Yeah. Wow. I didn't realize that. The advantage of having a big school is it can function in a lot of ways like a college campus in that you can offer a lot of different kinds of courses for kids. So there's a lot of options for students um, to take many, many different, um, electives. There are some 50 individual elective courses that kids can take. And I teach, um, now I teach four of them out of the 50, um, in the music department, we have a band program with three, uh, bands and two jazz ensembles, um, and a chorus program with a 120 voice concert choir, a women's choir of 36 voices or so, a men's choir of almost 30 voices, and a, 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 a um, an honors select mixed choir of about, I think, 30 voices. The orchestra program has uh, two freshman orchestras because it's that big and two other orchestras and a string ensemble. So we have a really robust, um, I'm very happy to say, music program, including guitar classes, intro to music theory, AP music theory, things like that. So I teach 
um, for levels of what really is music composition um, or what used to be called electronic music. Uh, we call it that here. Sorry if you're hearing New York yeah. City back. <laughs> it's giving a lot of ambience. It's just like a, I practically edited. like I've added it in. <laughs> okay, that's um, that's so normal. So the um, the big numbers, are great. Like you said, you can offer so many electives. But I guess you're in a way competing for students to choose your elective. Is that is that how it works generally? You know, if you don't get the numbers, they don't run. Well, if you're an elective teacher, that's true in anything. If you don't get the numbers, they don't run the course. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's always a certain level of competition, one would think, but. Um, I'm going to tell you my experience really is, uh, and I find this interesting, um, I'll talk on two levels. One is just being an elective teacher and you want to make sure that you're having as many students have the opportunity to take your class as possible. And then you have to be, it has to be appealing enough that they want to take it. They don't have to take my class. They could take 50 other, you know, electives. Or yeah, yeah. 46, <laughs> I should say. Yeah. You know? Keeps you honest and on track. <laughs> well, it's true. It's, yeah. it's absolutely true. Um, and so there's that generally speaking, if you're, if, if you're not filling the seats and they're not there. The other thing is, which I find very interesting, I was just talking to somebody about, is um, there is a fear, at least I've had people tell me, that they're afraid to have electronic music classes put into their school or some music technology class because – they're afraid it's going to detract from enrollment in band, orchestra, and chorus. Really? I, I would have thought in a way it would, uh, well, not help them, but it would cater for the, I mean, we've, I think we've probably talked about this before, it would cater yeah. for those that are not learning an instrument anyway. That would be that's one of the exactly big things. Right. Yeah. That's exactly That's been my experience. That's what I have seen. Um, that's what I've seen other people see. Um, and listen, my, my school's had electronic music since 1969. We were probably the first in the world to offer a music technology program in a high school. Um, there were a few that did it in Connecticut at the time, and it, it grew from the, the woman who started the program at my school. Her name is Ann Madunio. And she um, she then went on to teach these courses to teach what she does to other teachers. So there's kind of a legacy in that at Greenwich, I would say. And so uh, it's a culture in my school to have this here. So there isn't much competing going on between band, orchestra, chorus and electronic music. It's just been kind of uh, what the community expects. But I do know that there are there are other schools and I, I've done some consulting work where I've helped build studios or worked on curriculum for music technology and the the chorus or the band teacher or someone says you know what I'm afraid if we do this class that kids are going to sign up for that class and not sign up for my chorus and experience has shown me that that's just not the case you wind up getting kids who don't want to be in band orchestra chorus or for some reason they have never had the opportunity to learn by the time they get to high school they will have had to have known how to play an instrument they've never had that opportunity yes for some exactly reason. that that's the thing particularly you know if you haven't already had 10 12 years of learning of an instrument then you know you're on such a back foot and and maybe there isn't an, even an ensemble that caters for that beginner level by that stage anyway so yeah well, that- the other thing I think is important is that these music technology programs also have an opportunity for students to do contemporary popular music, which is not always addressed in band orchestra chorus. I know there's a lot, a lot, a lot of programs in the United States where people are doing um, non, uh, non-traditional ensembles. So there's, um, and I'm talking about things like mariachi is very big in in California, and um, and and there's other ensemble people do steel band here in the United States. So whatever. Yeah. And I, I've been to, uh, where was I? I was in, um, uh, I was at an international school in Amsterdam. Oh, it was in the Hague and, um, over there and they were using, they were doing gamelan. It's like, really? Yeah. Gamelan? yeah you know, well, we things... have that quite a bit here in Australia. Yeah. Gam- oh, Gamelan's sorry not, that. <laughs> not uncommon. <laughs> the closest to you Indonesia. Know, it's, I mean, somebody, somebody <laughs> learns something and they're like, oh, that's cool. Let's do that. And I don't have a problem with that. I think teachers should teach to their strength. So there's, there's a whole contemporary music thing that's going on now. It's like, look, in the United States, jazz ensembles were not considered popular at some point, right? Why should we do jazz? It's just this, it's not <laughs> real music. <laughs> and now it's huge. You wouldn't think of not having a jazz ensemble. Yeah, absolutely. Well, why absolutely. don't we have contemporary rock ensembles and pop ensembles and funk ensembles and yeah. electronic 
music ensembles. Do we, we have a bit of a growing movement. I mean, uh, partly I think thanks to um, Musical Futures, you know, which yes. sort of started in the United Kingdom and then has come out to Australia as well. And, and that's become quite popular and that's just a different approach. It doesn't suit every school, but it's great where it works. It really works well, I think. And, and that, yeah, that's, that's good. Do you have Musical Futures there too? Are people following that, that sort of approach? I think we have uh, Little Kids Rock is a different kind of approach here. I think Musical Futures is fantastic. I've seen their curriculum. I've seen their programs. I've seen their, uh, some of the materials they use for teacher development. So I think it's, I think it's worth a worthwhile uh, look for teachers who have access to it. We don't have as much access to it here. We have a a different program, which I think is fantastic. Also, any, my feeling is anything that gets a kid interested. Yeah. That's, that's my feeling too. Yeah. You know, Music, do it. Yeah, do it. Exactly. Grab the kid. Yeah, work work to and, their strengths and and their interests I mean, as well. How many kids really lo- uh, like you know dead white guys from Europe? You know, I know, I know. And there's still <laughs> in some places such a focus on that, but I, I do think it is changing. I think it's changed over previous years, and you know, it's it's heading a bit a bit further afield and I think technology has actually been a big part of that I mean it's opened up so many opportunities for people to to do and access easily you know things like creating a a drum part I mean I'm not a drummer I don't have a drum kit you know I can tap out a fairly decent rhythm but at least with you know garage band or some other sort of software I can actually record record something myself so that that's been a fantastic development I think over time. Yeah, I mean, if people haven't turned off this podcast already because I just dissed, uh, you know, dead white guy. <laughs> here, I mean, I, I do want to say, ironically, I was talking to my more one of my advanced classes today and I was telling them about, look, what I wanted to see in their tracks. You know, look, you have, you have melody, you have harmony, you've taken your harmonies, you've done proper voice leading and inversions and you can extrapolate a bass line. I said, now, what are uh, possible accompaniment patterns? And we started talking about arpeggiations and different kinds of arpeggiations and there's you know, um, single direction arpeggiation. What did we have to listen to and look at just as this example, Beethoven, Moonlight Sonata. So I I say we don't fit in dead white guys from Europe. I think it's incredibly important. (laughs) It's just how do you work it in? In what context? Why am I showing Moonlight Sonata? Why am I talking about Beethoven's Fifth Symphony for, um, uh, you know, melodic development, just little thematic tossing around the orchestra, you know, a little two note phrase really four with four notes articulated you know yeah. why, do you, why do we do that why do i show the right of spring you know yeah why do a, i listen, have them listen it's all about the relevance isn't it and and then it does make sense and they probably actually get a surprising interest in that music which they may not have had in the past and then can pick it up i mean my kids are often saying oh yeah that's the music from that commercial <laughs> I'm like that. That wasn't originally in that commercial, you know. A, right. a, a, a guy wrote that like <laughs> centuries ago. You know? Exactly. <laughs> so tell us about the electives that you've got at your school um, that you're actually teaching. So the four different ones. What what are okay. those? Okay. Well, I teach an introductory course, which is really just a taste of what what is this thing about making music on the computer, and what is this thing called? We we have Macintosh computers, so we use GarageBand, or as you say, GarageBand. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so we use GarageBand and, um, uh, and that's just because it's just such an easy piece of software. You don't have to worry about the software. The software doesn't get in the way or become so complex that you can't actually create. So it's mm. a good, it's good introductory level. It's a one semester course and we just, you know, give kids a taste. Um, and then I have a, I have a level uh, called electronic music one, you know, it's, it's studio composition and production. And the the idea is for that's really for kids who don't know much about um, music, good old fashioned music theory. You know, what are chords? How do I do chords based upon scale degrees? What are scales anyway? And um, and just really the mechanics of music, um, music theory at the piano keyboard, uh, mostly at the piano keyboard as opposed to notation, although I will be working in some notation, uh, more notation in next year. Um, and then I teach a course, a brand new course called Songwriting and Recording, because we have a brand new recording studio. We'll get to that in a second. Yoo-hoo. Yoo-hoo. <laughs> and I have an advanced uh, honors course in studio music composition. Um, and that's just, those are the most advanced kids. And we do all kinds of projects in music composition. Use And we use Logic for the advanced courses. Uh, and we have, yeah. And Pro Tools now in the recording studio. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Oh, right. we'll definitely talk about that. So, yeah. so in terms of technology, do your kids have um, like one-to-one devices at any level or are they mostly using the lab? 
that you've got yeah, there? Yeah, so the school went one-to-one, I think, two years ago using Chromebooks. Oh, right. You've got the Chromebooks. Okay, cool. So how have the Chromebooks yeah. been? I'm, I'm curious. I have a, a sort of a, you know, th- there's pluses and minuses and, um, you know, a lot of the minuses are to do with internet connection <laughs> and, you know, with heavy audio editing and recording and stuff. I mean, there's only so much you can do in the browser, really. I mean, you, you've got to get to right. a, a locally installed software program at some point. But, yeah, so how, well, like- how have they been? Have they been useful? Well, the kids use the Chromebooks basically just to we're 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 a, a Google Chrome school, so they basically use it to get in and out of Google Drive and whatever learning management system we're using, which happens to be Schoology. So it and and there are some cloud-based software that they will use um, that they can use for some of their projects, but mostly it's just for um, you know a word processing device in the cloud you know getting getting to their Google Doc or getting to uh, whatever they need to and share with their teachers whatever the Google spreadsheet is that they use and things like that so we're every pretty much Google based including um, all the storage mm. so I, it's not that I don't think um, the, as far as music technology in the cloud is concerned there's some very very good pieces of software especially entry-level software that no doubt can be used on a Chromebook or an iPad even um, that will work just fine for entry level software. So I think anybody K through um, six, seven, or even nine, depending upon what level you wanna do, can find some good entry level software like um, Music First Suites, um, including Soundation for Education, or um, uh, Soundtrap is an excellent program also. and what are some of the other online? Have I missed it? Well, so, yeah, Soundtrap and Soundation for that sort of stuff. And yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, they're, the, they're like my the favorite ones. Band. Yeah. That's the garage type of thing. So, you know, you have you cannot download something like Audacity, which is a, a an editing piece of software into Chrome, because, into a Chromebook. You can't download anything because the Chromebook isn't designed to hold any software. It's just to be to access. So those those softwares right now are they didn't used to function so well. They're functioning much better now. So much better. I know. When I when they so, first came along, I was like, why bother? It was just so painful and you just couldn't you do know, anything. But it's so much better now. So much better. You now. can get Pro Tools in the cloud now. Yes, I know. And so many um, software companies seem to be going that way and offering Absolutely. at least a version or even transitioning completely to, to a cloud version. Absolutely. So, so if it's a, the way of the future. Right. And I think if a school is one-to-one using something like a Chromebook or whatever they're using, um, whatever access device they're using, um, then all a lab like mine would need theoretically would be just a bigger screen to make it easier, you know, yes. and a mouse. Yes, so they right. would plug their book in and that's it. And they can do it in my class using their book. They could do it at home. I mean, that's just for convenience to give them a bigger screen, right? Yeah. It's funny you say so, that actually because, um, yeah, a couple of schools I've seen recently, they've they've had computer labs and they're kind of like to- tossing up with, you know, what are they going to do with them? The kids have now all got their own devices. So having computers in there doesn't make as much sense. So some of them are just leaving them set up as a workspace with a MIDI keyboard and a screen, like you say, and then the, the exactly. kids can come along and just plug in to that using their own device and and you know take their their stuff with them when they leave which is fantastic it's quite a good way to work I think I think it's going to be great yeah so tell us about your new lab so Barb's just had a new lab installed and uh, I've been seeing progress photos and video on uh, on Facebook in a couple of groups that we're in I think (laughs) yeah I'll give you a link to a, a video uh we did a new promo video to help promote the new space and the and for you know obviously it's for incoming freshmen to try and get them to sign up because we'd yeah. like them to sign up. Yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah so um so the school actually a very long time ago started a conversation about redoing all the music spaces so it's not just my lab the district is is very very much committed to um high level music education and um, we needed new spaces to really accommodate the very large music program that we have. The space we had, the teaching space was insufficient. So we have all new music spaces, new chorus rooms, band, orchestra, and and a new lab. So we have a new lab and a four-room suite recording studio. Um, so we have a control room, um, a three-room suite, I should say. I know how to count. A, control, <laughs> a very large control room and a an isolation room and what's called a live room. So it's kind of like a really big living room in a sense. Um, it's about the size of my living room, actually, when you think <laughs> of it. 
and um, and it's all sound uh, isolated, sound insulated, and uh, just and all wiring and everything done like a real pro level recording studio. Um, so it's not it doesn't just sit idly when we don't record. We do use it as breakout spaces and ensembles and and uh, for my kids to practice and play because um, having them do um, more work on learning. Um, other instruments as well, guitar, bass, piano, things like that. This episode of the Music Tech Teacher podcast is brought to you by Smart Music. Smart Music is the music learning platform that allows teachers to connect with students as they practice. It makes it easy to create individualised assignments, hear student recordings, and provides specific guidance. Smart Music also empowers students by providing them with immediate feedback both in terms of rhythm and pitch. This feedback transforms practice from passive repetition to active learning. The new Smart Music brings these resources into the cloud, so they work with Chromebooks, iPads, and other devices your students use today. Best of all, you can use it for free with limited repertoire, or access the full Smart Music library with an affordable pricing model that can be customized to fit any sized program. Learn more at smartmusic.com. So tell us about the lab and did you have, you had input right from the get-go with what was going to go into that and how it was laid out, I'm presuming, and you got to choose, you know, all the bits and pieces that went into it? Oh, yeah. So um, the lab, I I helped uh, design some of the lab that we had put in when I, I've been at the school since 2001 and when I first went to the school, uh, at first started at the school, we had eight computer stations with two kids on a station. They were old hand-me-down um, PCs with, you know, wires and cables and sound cards and all kinds of crazy stuff. And you had to restart the computers every 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, that was back in the day. And then miraculously, they decided to, uh, they did create and build a new lab that we, uh, I was sharing with a Mac lab, a dedicated Mac lab, because we were a PC school. And so they, they did a dedicated Mac lab for art and music. So I shared a room for 12 years. I think it is a little more, 14 years with the art department. So I would have this Mac half the time and they would have the Mac lab half the time because they did graphic arts. So I helped design the layout and the, and the, the setup for that, which was pull out drawers and all kinds of stuff. So I've done that lab and a couple of other labs. I do consulting work for schools around the country. Um, so what I've discovered is that, um, uh, mostly I build a desk that's custom made. So the drawers pull out and that's where the keyboard is. So the I was, keyboard's at the Yeah, I was going to ask you about the desk because often um, it's funny, a lot of people focus a lot on the, you know, which computer type of computer you're going to get and, and specs and all that sort of stuff and then software and then maybe yeah. MIDI keyboards and then the afterthought is often the desk and you actually need to kind of work that all in together at the same time because the size of your keyboards, if you've got them, obviously dictates desk space or each workstation space and and so on so yeah so Absolutely. so you customize so you've got pull out drawers for the, the what yeah, midi so keyboard the dis- is on there yeah so the kid sits at the station and you pull out the drawer and the piano is the right height to play yeah that's so brilliant. important how many kids get like back aches or neck aches because they're reaching up at the keyboard I and they know. can't and how and many what schools if- have you visited? <laughs> I've visited a number of schools where they might have the MIDI keyboard in place, a great place for playing. It's, you know, perfect position. But the key, the computer mouse and, you know, the, the trackpad or whatever is way up high. I don't know, so on some shelf or something. And so the poor kids yeah. are in this awkward position. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you're going to you're going to end up the physio like you know we need to shift this around a little bit so yeah that, that's it's so good when you thought through thing to do you just you know figure it yeah. out it's not it's they're not you know inexpensive but furniture is pretty expensive stuff so yeah yeah absolutely Anyways, so, so yeah so we have those we have the lab uh the thing about the new lab is that it was it was professionally installed i'll say that we were we had hb communications in uh in new york um uh, and connecticut to to the installation through the um the the, the builder because it's all built brand new built space so we have we're running on not only do we have an, a, a network for data which the school runs but they installed a second complete and separate network for audio oh uh, stop it and we're <laughs> yes we're on the dante network we run on dante uh to completely <laughs> sorry it's a cat it's a cat five network cat five cat six cable and we run on dante uh through a complete separate network and switches and i use 
um, piece of software called Dante Controller, and it all goes into my sound mixing board. And then I could get every kid coming out the speakers, but I can also have every single kid, any kid pair up or, or two or three of them listen to each other and work together and they could be on opposite ends of the room. Fantastic. Yeah, I did see a little preview actually at a, an event that I was presenting at. Someone showed us, you know, the, the Dante software and, um, and how it works and, and did a sort of a walkthrough of it all. It was great. It looked fantastic. Yeah, it's great. Wow, that's awesome. And so um, Mac computers again, obviously. Did you upgrade the Macs at that point as well or did you well, use you the know, ones you had? had? Yeah, no, no, no. The, the art department kept the ones they had. So since we had a new lab, they had to go out and buy us new Macs. So that was pretty sweet. <laughs> had to. <laughs> oh, by the way, while you're at it, we'll take the larger screen, please. Yeah, Thank that's you, right. Yeah, there's not, can't go backwards. No going backwards. That's oh, right. well, yeah, I, th- I think it um, must be a dream for, for some people who have very little resources they're only you know they're quite jealous i'm sure hearing about <laughs> to the setup well, that you've got you know, now but it, yeah greenwich has been working on this for a long time and if anybody knows greenwich is not a um greenwich is greenwich is a, a town of some wealth uh they're not very you know I, I don't know what to say we have we do have students who are on, who are a uh, significant number of students on free and reduced lunch what we call title one schools that means there's enough students who have um who require this um, free and reduced lunch subsidiary that we do and that the school is federally funded. So we have we have some poverty because we have pub- public housing, but we also have some of the wealthiest people in the United States <laughs> living right here in Greenwich. So thank you very much. <laughs> nice combination. <laughs> yeah. Notice I do not live in Greenwich. Just no, so you know. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Can't afford it. I'm his teacher. And the lab's been up and running now for quite, well, a little bit of time, isn't it? It's not, not months. Yeah, months, we, opened, we opened this last fall. Uh, yeah. For us, it's fall, so that's September for us, uh, August, oh, it, the end of August. Oh, it's longer ago than I thought then. Well, I was thinking it was yeah, just a couple so of months. Yeah, so we opened okay. all the new, new facilities and it's just been, you know, I mean, look, when you open a new facility, no matter how much you think you know, is always a huge learning curve. So especially with the new Dante network, which is really, really new for Dante also. So Yeah, um, absolutely. And the, the kids, I mean, has uh, has it changed enrollments in your electives, do you think, just because of the new facilities? Well, I think it has. Remember, we just opened this year and my enrollment has gone up uh, for next year, students asking classes. So I think that the new facility has made a difference. We also have a new um, graduation requirement, and which requires a little bit more of the elective. So I think that may have made a difference. Uh, I think that new video really sparked interest in a lot of uh, freshmen. And, uh, you know, the word's out. I'm a cool teacher. What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> well, we know that. <laughs> Just, you. Well, as long as they know that. <laughs> Just touch on the video for a minute. So um, the video was made. Did you make? Did you have students make that? or I had a student make it. We, have a, we had a guy. He was one of my students. And he is a, he's into video. And he has been doing, like, we have this little video newscast at once a month. And he's been working on it. So I saw his work, which was, I didn't know he did all this great video. And he's just oh. absolutely spectacular. Elijah um, did the video. Um, I'll mispronounce his last name, but it is on the video. You'll see it. And so I just said to him, hey, dude, can you help me out? And he said, no, miss, I'm so busy. I can't, I can't, I can't. So I said, guess what? I'll pay you. So, <laughs> That's so always I, the way. I actually paid him out of my own pocket to do it. I don't I don't see any problem with that. Uh, really. That's fantastic. Uh, I think um, I think that more teachers should maybe consider doing something. I mean, it doesn't have to be an over-the-top production or you don't even have to hire someone else to do it necessarily. But to make a little video about your own, you know, department and what you're doing or, you know, your classes just for advocacy purposes I think is a great thing to do yeah absolutely and I could never do anything as cool and hip as he did so uh, all the music in there is are actually is music of former students so it's it's um it's all the music that we do there and uh you'll hear students talking and and you'll get a glimpse of the lab and a little bit of me while we're at it um so it's really nicely done it's it's keep it short that's my my recommendation totally something like yeah under four minutes absolutely no one's going to watch it you know yeah yeah or less. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Switch off otherwise. Now, you have a little motto which um, it has been widely quoted, I think, uh, with, with those of us in the online space, sort of in music technology, which is teach music, the technology will follow. And yes, now you own $25. Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> Copyright. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love, th- I love that. I mean, it, it resonates well with those of us that do, you know, this sort of thing all the time because, um, and, and I was saying this to Amy Burns, who I chatted to last week for the podcast, and, you know, we, we're in this big 
Facebook group on, um, you know, called Music Teachers and there's over 20,000 people. And Amy and I were talking about, you know, there's a cycle of questions that come up and one of them frequently is, I've got a new iPad, which apps should I get? Or I have a right. Mac, you know, or I have a PC, what apps, you know, what software should I right. be looking at? And, and I mean, the three of us always sort of think, oh, maybe the question needs to be the other way around. What is it? Do you, do you want to teach the students and then fit the software around that, you know? So it's all about teaching first. I mean, and, and I think that's the great thing about your book. It's all about the projects that are in the book are focused on the composition or aspects of composition. So tell, tell us a little bit about the book and, and what it's, you know, what's in it. I mean, it's been such a great thing. It was funny when I was reading it, uh, so many of the things that you have described in the book in terms of projects are the things that I've been running in workshops a lot as well. And so that really resonated with me. And I thought, oh, that's good. It makes me feel like I'm on the right track as well. And uh, Dr. Scott Watson, who's, you know, a mutual friend who also has a, a book as well. And um, he's, uh, again, similar too. you know, there's a lot of crossover in what we all do. So, so tell us about the book and, and how it came to be. I don't even think I know that story. Well, I, um, I first started teaching um, 20 years ago, so someone else do the math, and I, um, I, I was teaching in New York City public school. I started teaching in my 30s, and I, I had not gone to teacher school. I had not gotten my degree in education. I have, I have two degrees in music performance, um, so I decided to go into teaching um, – uh, mostly because I needed a more steady job <laughs> for various reasons. And I was like, you know what? I, I had a stepdaughter who just went through high school. I liked high school kids. And um, I thought, you know what? I could teach high school. Both my parents were teachers, so I probably resisted it just because both my parents were teachers. It's me too. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, right? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I, I sort of thought, you know, I'll just maybe see what else is out there because my, right. both of my parents are teachers too. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, it's in your blood. You can't help it. Exactly. So. Yeah. So I, I said, you know, what? I'll teach general music, whatever. And I wound up going to a very good school in New York City. It's actually not far from where I live right now. And it was a blue ribbon school. So it, but it had thirty five hundred students in it. Um, wow. That's a lot of students in a building that was only made for something like twenty four. Oh, my gosh. So what they had to do is move to three or four different si of, of shifts. So the first shift started at seven and got out at like one thirty, And then the last shift started at something like 1030 and got out at four something, you know, so we had these shifts of kids coming through this building. So what's the problem? You see this a lot. Uh, I've seen this a lot in the United States. You've seen it in entire cities like the city of Yonkers. It happened a few years ago and the state of California. It even happened to. And that is what do you do when when you have very little money and you still have to give kids required credit? Well, what they have is they had 50 kids in a class, 50 kids, oh. because the legal limit in music in New York City is 50, or I think it's New York State, too. Um, yeah, New York State. So it's 50, because you, they didn't separate out classroom teaching from ensemble teaching. That's so if you crazy. Have a band, yeah, it's cool, right? But now I'm in a classroom teaching kids in general, quote unquote, general music with 50 kids. No. This is, this is my first <laughs> teaching assignment, okay? Okay. Oh. <laughs> everything's easier after this <laughs> oh my goodness now I don't know how people do it when they're 23 years old I mean I was 33 I just you know I just don't know how they do it when they're that young so anyway so I I was given this old old book you know it was like a loose leaf binder three inches thick and they said okay teach this and it was like it was music I didn't even listen to and I remember I'm classically trained musician right I have two degrees in performance I've played a lot so anyway so it's like, this is old stuff. And they were showing movies like Dr. Zhivago, like that was supposed to show you <laughs> something about Russian music. It was so ridiculous. Was, this was such an ancient curriculum. And they happened to have had hiding in a closet because somebody had money, a collection of um, books McGraw-Hill had put out. I think it was McGraw-Hill. And it was this complete curriculum. I think it was called Music, Its Role and Importance in Our Lives. And it came with a teacher binder and it gave you lesson plans in this binder with a textbook, with video, with CDs. And I, this saved my life because now I could do something that was a little bit more hip and cool, a little bit multicultural. But what I all I had to do is go home the weekend before and come up with a few lessons, read the lessons and go and teach these lessons. So yeah. I thought to myself, finally, when I was teaching music technology and struggling through it, what do I do? What do I do? How do I figure this out? What do I do? So I started in 2001, come 2009 or so, I thought, you know what? It would be really cool 
I think, if teachers had some sort of, what if I have to teach this, what do I do? And they could have access to material very much like I had when I first started teaching uh, and had this this curriculum. So I started to just kind of write out a whole bunch of stuff that I had learned and discovered and some of the lessons, many of the lessons, most of the lessons that I had and put them into this collection. And so the book turns out to be um, something like 26 units of study with 68 lessons in it and a collection of, um, of, of um, projects. Um, so that's really what it was based on. So to really be a tool for people, what do I do now if I have to teach this? Yeah. And. And people can tweak it on their own and make it their own and use this or don't use that. And when you can then buy the second edition that should be coming out in about two years. <laughs> and I think that's such a better way to think about things. I mean, it comes back to that whole, you know, I've got an iPad, what app should I get? You know, it's more about, I, I think um, teachers who are not comfortable maybe with using technology, it's the, off the thought process is often that technology ends up being a separate part of their class, a separate thing that they do. So, you know, now we right. do playing and singing and now we're going to do technology. Whereas, I mean, I think you and I and a lot of other teachers that I know who use it quite a lot are more about interweaving it into, you know, what you normally do. So you, you are still teaching the pentatonic scale, but you just happen to be using technology to reinforce it or, or play it exactly. or record it or, or whatever it is. And yeah, I think that's, that's such a great approach you know yeah technology is the tool my book doesn't even talk about specific technology this is about look what do i do how do you teach kids the pro how do you teach them composition how do you teach the music theory yeah and how yeah. do you use what's available to you whether it's notation software or something like garage band or logic or even pro tools what do i how do i teach music and then how is the technology a tool for students to then create music to demonstrate their learning or to capture and edit things as they go, it's just a tool, just as a pen and paper is a tool, just as the trumpet or clarinet is a tool, the ensemble is a tool in which students then um, use to show their learning in music. That's all this thing is. Yeah. Um, and if you take that approach, then you also get around the fact that technology changes a lot too. And, you know, if the, the approach is about how to record and, I mean, once you know something like GarageBand, it really so there's so many programs which are similar, you know, all the recording and editing programs work in a very similar way. So once you're comfortable with one, you can apply exactly the same things to the next one that you might be using or the upgraded version or the whatever. And, and it becomes less scary when software updates, which is always, <laughs> always fun. I actually remember being at your place uh, when we were about to both go and present at the, the Texas right. Music <laughs> Educators Association conference. And, and I, I said, we were snowed in and I said, oh, I think I'll just get out the GarageBand iPad app and just check a couple of things. And I opened it up and the entire thing had updated and it was a huge update. It looked totally different and it had all this extra thing in it. And I was like, okay, okay I'll just sit here for a little while quietly with my headphones on. <laughs> Learn this new Learn software. This, yeah, that I'm about to present on. Uh, yeah, I think always fun. But, but you do get less scared. I mean, really... It, it's not really an issue because if you know the basic principles of how they all work and you're focused on the musical aspect of what you're teaching, it, it it's less of an issue, you know? Yeah, it is, it is less of an issue, but I will tell you after doing this for 16 years, it's the, the thing that is different. Look, I'm going to teach kids about melody writing and that doesn't change. Yeah. I'm going to teach kids about chords and chord progressions and that doesn't change. However, the technology does change, which which requires me to keep teaching and myself and learning myself about this. The technology is a moving target. It's not like, OK, I teach piano and the piano and ped piano pedagogy pretty much doesn't change. Yeah. OK, it, it just doesn't. And it may be that the kid has this piano or that piano or something else, but it that doesn't change. You know how to the you know how to teach that once the technology changes, sometimes the need for changing and shifting the pedagogy happens or needs to happen. Yeah, that's true, actually. And and sometimes the technology, I think the, the changes in technology allow you to do things perhaps with students that you weren't able to do in the past. I mean, film scoring is often a, an example I give, you know, film scoring 
you could have done the, the composition part of it, you know, but in the early days before computers were around, you couldn't really sync up a video and have recorded all the parts to it, even instruments that you don't play yourself and, you know, put it all together in a, in a single file. And today I love that. I love that you can do that, you know, with film scoring, it opens up this whole amazing world of, you know, exciting stuff that you can do. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, a lot of technology, it opens up not just what you can do um, and what kids can do themselves, but it makes uh, music accessible to students who might not otherwise have it accessible, especially students with special needs. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, I'm hoping to get someone on to talk about that particular area in a separate episode sometime soon too. Um, so tell, tell people where, the, where can they find out more about you and your book? Um, well, they could go to musicedtech.com uh, to find out a little bit more about me and my book. They can also visit uh, the Greenwich Public Schools uh, website. I think there's a site available for um, music tech. They also changed over the whole website, and I'm really not sure what's been up to date. I've been too busy trying to get Dante to work. So, uh, <laughs> Dante uh, sounds like a friend, a friend in your classroom. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And and I do welcome inquiries from anybody. If anybody has a question for me or they need some help or they they um uh or you know they want to bring me over to uh, do some <laughs> workshops and stuff for them or do some consulting to set up a lab, I'm happy to do that. They can reach me at barb, B A R B at musicedtech.com. Excellent. It's been so great chatting today. We, we love talking to each other. We don't get to do it nearly enough, even though we're, we're just barely a, a Facebook message away from each other at most days. <laughs> but but you know, we need to catch up in person, I think, sometime soon. I, I was saying to Amy, I'm hoping to get back to Texas next year if I can swing it. It's just that awkward Yay. time of year for us, you know, with the beginning of the school year and everything. But yes. I'll, I'll see what I can do. Really, really That'd hoping to do that. Yeah, those, we need a big reunion. Yeah, I could do in-person podcast interviews. That would be even better. I'll take a microphone oh, or two with me. Yeah, I think that would be really good. Okay. So thank you so much for chatting today. I will put all the links to things that Barb's mentioned in the show notes for this episode. And um, you can find the, the link to her website. I'll link to the video that she's mentioned and to her book as well. So thank you very much, Barb, and I hope we'll speak soon. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. The Music Tech Teacher podcast is hosted by me, Katie Wardrobe. You can find more information and links from today's episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash 19. Testing. Oh, yeah, I think that's where. Can you just say a couple of words? Some enchanted evening. <laughs> well, I'll take the words. But test, test, two, two. Yeah. <laughs> Are you getting too much background noise from me? No, I think it's fine. I think it's fine.